Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Uh, today we want to uh, look at a book entitled Onward, written by Russell Moore. Uh, today we have with us uh, Senior Pastor Lee Compson from Milford uh, First Brethren Church in Milford, Northern Indiana, here to share with us uh, this, this work entitled Onward. Lee, welcome. Thank you, Herb. Well, uh, let's get on with it. <laughs> uh, what's the thesis of this book, Onward? Well, the s subtitle kind of sums it up pretty well. It's, it's engaging the culture without losing the gospel. And uh, I think that's his, his main thesis. How do we as Christians in this postmodern age uh, in the United States of America in 2000s, in the late, uh, early 2000s, uh, how do we... Uh, be in the world but not of the world, and how do we maintain our gospel witness, uh, still affirming the uh, gospel values that we have uh, without um, maybe making the mistakes that previous generations have made, and how do, how do we maintain a, the faithfulness and integrity in the midst of a chaotic world. So he, he, he breaks it down well, and he offers, I think, some real biblical arguments for how we can engage our culture uh, with a redemptive purpose. Okay, so let's talk about um, how he breaks it down. How does this, how does this book unfold uh, when you think about chapter by chapter or section <clears throat> by section? How does, how does he um, unfold this thesis? Sure. Overall, he's going to break down into different categories, and I'll get those, into those in a second. But at the beginning, uh, he does something, he takes an interesting tone, I guess. He, he is essentially wants to get us to recognize that we have lost the culture war. We are a minority as far as gospel-believing, Bible-believing um, Christians. Uh, we, have, we have lost the culture war. And, and he's pretty honest about that. He backs it up with good evidence and support. And uh, he, he wants to recognize that, that fact that we are a minority, but that's not a, a cause for hopelessness or to tear our hair out um, or to just go be monks somewhere and isolate ourselves from the world. Um, he uh, encourages uh, believers to uh, a mission, and, and much of the book revolves around the different areas of Christian life that we can engage culture in. And so he, he addresses things like um, our kingdom and kingdom uh, identity, uh, who we are as, as, as children of God, um, though not necessarily a dispensationalist. He uses very uh, um, widely dispensational terms like already, not yet. He wants us to understand how we can approach um, the world given who we are and what Christ has done for us and what that means to the larger world, and, but still with that hope of, of Christ returning and what, what that means for us. Um, and he gets into politics uh, recently, he's kind of become a, a lightning rod for criticism within Christian uh, Christianity. Uh, he's the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission head. That's the ar the political arm of the Southern Baptist, and he he received some flack for uh, critic being critical of of Trump, President Trump, and some of President Trump's supporters. And so uh, he wrote this before he really got a lot of that flack, but he he does a nice job. Uh, kind of outlining how we can approach even something like politics given our kingdom identity and kingdom purpose. But he'll get in, he gets it more into to culture and how church ought to have, uh, you know, an influence uh, into culture. He gets into our, our mission, kind of our, our gospel foundation to our social witness is essentially how he, he portrays it. You know, some Christians kind of hesitate or kind of recoil when they hear the, the ideas of social justice, but he approaches it, hey, the gospel should lead us to impact our world socially. So when we see poor people, when we see oppressed people, when we see um, disadvantaged people, we should be defending them because of the gospel. And he makes some great biblical arguments for why we should do that and what we should do. He gets into more, uh, I guess, popular evangelical political issues like uh, human dignity, uh, you know, being pro-life. He talks about religious liberty, um, but he also is, um, he does a nice job of, of tempering some of that. A lot of 
religious liberty champions these days will feel offended any time they encounter resistance. And he said, being offended or, or, or finding resistance within the larger culture is not being persecuted. Don't mix that up. He wants us to be clear about um, what we should expect if we're championing these ideas, but um, not to be overly sensitive to some of those things. It, one line he even says, we are Americans best when we are not Americans first, mm. which is uh, really, really good. I think it's a, a great approach. We are Americans best when we're not Americans first. Again, getting back to that idea of being kingdom people. Um, but he talks about family values and how we view the family and what purpose that has in the culture. And then talks about being people of convictional kindness. Who are people of grace. And then he kind of ends it with a call to a gospel revolution in that if, if, if uh, we are going to truly transform the world, again, it must be centered on the gospel and how that impacts all of, all of our life and, and how that can impact everyone around us. So let me, um, let me jump in here and m maybe throw a little curve at you uh, because right. um, we have some prescriptive uh, questions. <laughs> um, uh, in, in some ways, he almost sounds like one John. Uh, don't be surprised that the world mm -hmm. hates you because they've hated me, Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then this idea of uh, the world's going to know us by the way we love one another and within the body. And so, uh, so I mean, uh, that resonates with me personally, particularly since I'm currently in the midst of working through 1 John <laughs> with, with Aaron Peer. Um, but to find gospel... Uh, when, because we're, we've, we've thrown that term out, sure. um, sometimes, you know, you read the Gospel of Mark and Jesus goes out and preaches the Gospel. And what's the mm -hmm. Gospel? The Kingdom of God is at hand. And then we have a definition of what the Gospel might be and might be the four spiritual laws where, you know, you're a sinner and Jesus died for our sins and that He rose again and that He's God. and and that's the gospel message, and you gotta have all those steps in it. How is he defining gospel? What, uh, how, what, what's his definition of gospel? Sure. Now, I'm probably not gonna paraphrase it perfectly, but um, his, uh, as I was reading the book, his definition, his approach and understanding of the gospel very much fit with mine, so, uh, but he, he would uh, define the gospel, I believe, as as yeah, recognizing Jesus is our King, He is our and He is our Savior, our our, uh, our God, our Lord, and our Savior who came in and died for us and for the forgiveness of our sins, that all who have faith and, and trust in Him will receive eternal life. Um, he he underscores that point, but he would also, um, I, I believe, add to that uh, the fact that the gospel ought to impact our lives. So it's not just a one-time decision. I'm getting my get out of hell free card and God doesn't care about, you know, how I live the rest of my life anymore. You know, some, some people understand the gospel is just a one-time decision. No, he would, uh, more approaches it in that the gospel ought to transform and impact our entire lives. So it's a recognition of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, and then how that gives us a purpose for our entire lives, the fruit we ought to bear. Uh, so, um, it, not necessarily the, an exact four spiritual laws kind of gospel, but it, it is basically recognizing Jesus for who he is as, as our Savior King and the fact that what he has done for us gives us eternal life and that gives us a purpose and a mission to uh, transform the world around us, to impact the world around us for God's glory. Okay. Um, what spurred you to read this book? I mean, all the books that are out there, uh, what, what was it that triggered you to want to read this book? Well, I'd, I'd seen it highly recommended at different places, places like Christianity Today, and, and, and I, I knew individuals who had, had read it, and, um, and yeah, they had very good things to say. The reason, I, and I honestly, I kind of started it maybe a year or so ago, and never really finished it, that's just a, a bad personal habit of mine. I start things and like I start books and never finish them. But what really got me to, to finish it was the fact that he was becoming more and more high profile as, as the political uh, calendar went with the election last year. Um, 
Uh, and the, the fact that um, it was very pertinent. He wrote this, I believe, in 2015 as the election cycle was just starting. But as the election cycle really got to full bore, it, he, I mean, the things he writes in the book, I, I kept reading chapter after chapter, became much more and more real as I'm watching the television and seeing the candidates and seeing the debates and the discussions and the, the, the issues that even Christians were having. So I felt like uh, the more I read it, the more prophetic it seemed uh, as, as he obviously was looking ahead and seeing how these issues needed to be understood by, by Christians. And I, I'm not sure that uh, Christianity as a whole truly embraced his message necessarily, but I think this book represents a, a good, um, a, a good uh, direction point, a good guidepost for us to, to follow um, moving forward and given our circumstances and the political climate that we're in. And when you say us, um, I'm assuming that uh, he's writing as an evangelical and uh, looking at some of these things from an evangelical point mm -hmm. of view does he give you the indication that uh, he favors one political party over the other and that's influencing him? Or is he really being even-handed in the manner in which he deals with these issues as he sees them uh, uh, portrayed uh, in, in Scripture? Yeah, I don't, I don't see necessarily a political uh, stance kind of motivating or driving him. I would say, uh, while he's, he's very fair in his approach, he is probably being more critical or the, of the classic conservative evangelical movement um, because I think that's where he's coming from. And, and, and honestly, that is probably the, the majority of the uh, active political uh, realm of, of Christians. Christians who are active politically are probably going to be from that. So I think he is trying to um, address his own tribe, as it were, um, where the, he's trying to point out our, our, our weaknesses and where we need to go moving forward. Um, not that he doesn't maybe address a more liberal Christianity, but his focus, again, is what is, what is the gospel, how does the gospel bring to bear in, in, in how we live this life in this culture, politically and socially? So I, I think there were probably, if maybe I was a super liberal Christian, I would probably feel convicted with some of the things he said, and I definitely know, uh, can see how the conservative, uh, uber conservative Christians would be very convicted with the things he's, he's written. So I, I think both sides can probably learn from what he has to say. I think his point of view is probably one speaking to the more conservative side, just because that's, that's where his world is, what his world is. Um. When you think about this book, and of course we're right back to this idea that, you know, there's only so much an author can put into a book. And um, everybody struggles with what do I put in, what do I leave out. What would you say uh, would be something you wish he had addressed? Uh, is there something that you, you, you really, it's clear you really have appreciated the book. Yeah. Uh, but is there anything that kind of stands out in your mind that you wish he had addressed that he didn't? Well, I, I think he, he might have addressed uh, what might be a growing segment of, of Christ, the Christian world is, is that more liberal, uh, liberal Christian worldview who might identify themselves maybe as Democrats rather than Christians who have classically been known as Republicans. So he might have, he, he, he might have been able to address that a little bit more. That I can't, as far as issues are concerned, he seemed to touch on them uh, to some extent throughout, throughout the book at one point or another um, when it comes to, to guns and our approach to being people of peace versus uh, you know, cult arms. I, I wouldn't agree with, with all of his, his views on that, but um, he, he still addresses it. He talks about being pro-life, but also defending, you know, uh, the lives of the elderly and, and everybody in between. You know, many people criticize Christians for only caring about the baby in the womb and not being pro-life after it's born. But he does a great job uh, of, of covering that. So, um, there aren't a whole lot of, um, there, there might have been some more how-tos, I guess. You know, what, what are some one or two things that we can take from this and apply um, 
in, in each of these areas. Uh, but um, the, the book does a nice job of at least pushing us in the right direction if it doesn't give us the exact tools. Okay. Um, can you think of any other books um, that are somewhat um, comparable to this one that causes us as evangelicals perhaps think a little better about our political situation here in America? Does any, any other sure. stand out? I know there's one classic work by, uh, I believe, a generation previous to, to, to this one right now, currently uh, by Richard Niebuhr, I believe is how you pronounce it. It's called Christ and Culture. It's, it's a classic. It's, it tends to be the one that uh, has really shaped the approach of, of Christians and, and how they are, uh, how we are to think about Christ and culture. He, he does Christ against culture, Christ of culture, Christ transforming culture, something like that. His, his approach has been used uh, by many. Um, I know D.A. Carson um, has kind of responded to that. He has one called Christ and Culture, I believe. Even his Gagging of God, uh, which is like a million pages long book, um, it addresses the postmodern society that we're world in, and I think in certain segments um, addresses these kinds of things, how we ought to um, uh, transform culture. And I know um, McKnight and, and Modica, uh, I believe, uh, which will be reviewed here in our video series, have written one called Jesus is Lord, Caesar is Not. And that's a, a similar, how do we live in this world that calls for political allegiance and yet we are people, we are citizens of heaven. Uh, so there, those are, those are a, a few that I know are out there that are kind of standards. Okay. Um, one that comes to my mind, uh, hopefully I will get the title uh, correct. It's by Daryl Bach. If Jesus were here, who would he vote for? <laughs> uh, 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 and of course, he's he was zeroing in on the most recent election of uh, 2016, and uh, but um, that one also stands out in my mind. But uh, Lee, thank you so very much uh, for coming and sharing this book. It's great to be here. Definitely something for us, all of us as evangelicals, to think our way through. How do we relate to our pluralistic society as evangelicals today? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for joining us. And I trust that uh, uh, this might be a book you'd consider reading uh, and, um, and uh, to think your way through. How do we as evangelicals impact our world for Jesus Christ as we live day by day for him? In the meantime, I trust that you will walk with the King and be a blessing to everyone that you come in contact with. Thank you.